Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church, Plumas, Manitoba, a congregation of Lutheran Church Canada. Here is our pastor with Sunday's homily. Faith, hope, and joy fill your hearts in your believing. Amen. The question posed by the chief priests and elders of the people to Jesus was a question on authority. And in response, Jesus turns the tables on the chief priests and the elders and asks a similar question. The baptism of John, by whose authority did it come? From heaven or from man? Both questions required the exact same answer. Seeing that all held that St. John the Baptist was a prophet, the question should have really led the chief priests and elders of the people to confess that John's baptism came from heaven above, and therefore Jesus likewise came from heaven above. But the chief priests and elders of the people had no intention in understanding Jesus' authority or his teaching. The question they posed was not asked out of genuine interest or understanding of Jesus but rather to try to trap Jesus in a controversial conundrum, to catch him speaking something false about their tradition or understanding. The intent of their question was to challenge the source and origin of Jesus' authority not to understand it. It was a loaded question with malicious intent, and it grew out of a plot to put Jesus to death. You recall the context of when this question emerged. It emerged during Holy Week. In the Gospel, according to St. John, chapter 11, prior to Holy Week, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, which is just southeast of Jerusalem. And the raising of Lazarus from the dead is very key here to why this question was asked. You see, this miracle happened in the southern region of Israel where both the enemies of Jesus and his followers witnessed the miracle. Most of the miracles that Jesus performed took place in the northern region, in Galilee of the Gentiles, and the chief priests and elders and Pharisees and teachers of the law only heard about those miracles. Here at Bethany in the southern region, both the followers of Jesus and the enemies of Jesus saw the miracle. They witnessed the miracle. And so some of the Pharisees who had witnessed the miracle called a meeting of the Council of the Sanhedrin, and they posed the following question. What are we to do? If this man Jesus goes on like this, everyone will believe in him, for this man performs many miracles. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, had said and responded prophetically, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And from that point onward, after the raising of Lazarus, and at the time of this council meeting, these members of the council made plans to put Jesus to death. So after the council's plot to kill Jesus, Jesus then fulfills the messianic promises of the Old Testament. He comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and he's hailed the messianic king to the Hosanna cheering crowds. And to further frustrate the ones who plotted to put him to death, he enters the temple the next day and drives out all those who bought and sold in the temple and declares with all authority, it is written, my house is a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. And on the following day, Jesus enters the temple and began to teach the people. It's at this point that the chief priests and the elders of the people come up to Jesus and ask him that loaded question, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? You see, the question has a context. The question of the religious leaders emerges out of the malicious intent to put Jesus to death because Jesus had performed many miracles 
And so the question comes to a climax before, during, and after Palm Sunday. And so there's questions behind the question. So the real question that they were asking is, by whose authority, Jesus, did you raise the dead? Lazarus. By whose authority did you come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and be hailed the Messianic King? By whose authority did you come into the temple, Jesus, and cleanse it out and overturn the tables of the money changers? By whose authority do you come into the temple and publicly teach? Do you see all the questions behind this question? By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? That same question of authority that the chief priests and the elders of the people is a question I think is still being asked today. Many non-believers, skeptics, non-Christians today question the authority of Jesus to forgive, to heal eternally, to bring to everlasting life through his death and resurrection from the dead for eternal life. And some go so far as to deny the divinity of Jesus, and they try to explain away all his miracles, which leaves little room then for his authority to forgive and heal eternally through his death and resurrection. And to deny Christ of his divinity and authority is to rob him as he truly is, as the eternal Son of God, who appeared in the flesh to forgive the sin of the world by his death on the cross and to bring life for the world by his resurrection from the dead. For the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ from the dead confirms his claim to be the eternal Son of God who has authority to forgive and heal eternally. Baptized, believing, communing Christians will not necessarily deny our Lord's divinity and his authority to forgive and heal eternally, but they will at times question, reject, or even deny some of his words and his teaching albeit they do it in a very subtle kind of way. I've never met a Christian who denies the great good news of the gospel, that Jesus came into the world to die for sinners in order to grant them everlasting life through his death and resurrection. But I have met some Christians who deny the teaching of the word of God, the fullness of God, not just his gospel, but also his law, for these things go together, and specifically the application of the law. As you know, the law teaches us and commands us to do good works of thought, word, and deed, so that we might lead a godly, pleasing life in our daily calling in life, whether it be a farmer, a worker, a husband, a wife, a, a citizen. And so the law guides us. It tells us what not to do and what to do. <clears throat> But also the law condemns and punishes our sin and rebellion when we avoid its direction or ignore its authority. Let's take, for example, if you're going down a highway and you notice that the speed limit is 100 kilometers per hour and you exceed the speed limit and go 130. Now, there may be no apparent consequences to breaking that speed limit law, but if a police officer is there and pulls you over and gives you a ticket, you will know that the law has authority, that there are consequences to the law. In the same way, the law of God may seem as if there are no apparent consequences. But the Apostle Paul writes the Galatian Christians, do not be deceived, God is not necessarily mocked. The Lord God Almighty knows the hearts and intentions of every human being, and he desires, according to Ezekiel today, that all continue in repentance and receive forgiveness, because God does not desire the death of anyone. He wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And regardless of whether or not we think or believe that the law is applicable to our life in Christ or not, and therefore, if the Lord says, thou shalt not, then we shall not. So really the question we really need to ask ourselves today is, 
Who is our authority? Who is our I said so? Who is your I said so? Who is the one who has authority to teach and command you to lead a God-pleasing life to the honor and praise of God's name? Is it ourselves and our own personal pious opinions that we've gleaned from others, the internet, and other sources that are outside of the word of God? Is it our family members, our friends? Is it the government? God forbid. Is it our public schools, our universities, the teachers, the professors, our parents, society, the world? Is our authority celebrities or professional athletes? Who is our authority? Who is our I said so? Who is the one who has the authority to command us to do certain things and to avoid the passions and desires of the flesh? Well, for the Christian, I think Paul the Apostle put it very well in verse 14 of the epistle lesson. He says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Holding fast to to the word of life. For the baptized, believing, communing Christian, the authority, the I said so, is the eternal word of God and the eternal God himself. We hold fast to the word of life. And this word of life not only includes the law, but also the gospel. For the Christian cannot have the gospel without the law and the law without the gospel. To ignore and reject the law of God is really to ignore and reject the teaching and application of God's forgiveness in our life in the gospel. Because if you think about it, if you have nothing to be forgiven for, then you don't need forgiveness. If we truly believe that we have never breached the law of God in terms of what God commands us to do and avoid, then we really don't need Jesus as our Savior who saves us from all those times we break and breach the commandments of God. If we do not need to be saved, then we do not need a Savior. We don't need to be here right now. If we have not been crushed, condemned, and damned under the law of God, then we cannot be healed, restored, and forgiven by the great good news of the gospel. If we deny the authority of the law of God, and that it applies to us and our lives and our sin and rebellion, then we also deny ourselves of the gospel. How Jesus came into this world to die on the cross for all our sin and rebellion against the law of God, and even when we question the word of God and its authority. Jesus came into this world not to condemn us, but to save us and to heal us and not to leave us condemned by the law because the fullness of God's teaching is both his law and his gospel. When we question and deny the authority of the law of God, God promises to forgive, forgive by the gospel. The great good news for us and for all people who break the law of God is that Jesus came into this world to die for those who turn and have a complete reorientation of their life and repentance and receive his forgiveness that he earned on the cross when he died for all the times we question his word, his law, and his authority. And that forgiveness that Jesus earned is applied to us in his word, his sacraments, so that we may know his forgiveness and his eternal love. That's the gospel, that Jesus appeared in the flesh to die on the cross for our sin and rebellion against the law, and through this forgiveness that he gives to us in word and sacrament, we can lead a God-pleasing life in our vocation to the honor and praise of his holy name. For our God and Father did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through his life, 
his death, his burial, and his glorious resurrection from the dead. And by his death and resurrection from the dead, Jesus indeed has all authority to forgive and grant you everlasting life in his name. And because Jesus died and rose again from the dead, he says to his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. By Jesus' cross and passion, he has forgiven the sins of all repentant sinners. By his glorious resurrection from the dead, he has trampled down death by death and has opened the way of everlasting life for you and all who believe in him. And by having all authority, Jesus gives his authority away, which really demonstrates that he has all authority. Those who have authority um, help others to act on authority, on his authority. He gives his authority away. He uh, commands others to act on his behalf, to speak his holy word of forgiveness, to send out you, laborers, into the harvest, the priesthood of all believers, to speak his holy word of forgiveness to those who do not know it, to those who are estranged from him and his church so that they may receive his eternal gifts in his word and sacraments. And publicly in his church, he sends and authorizes pastors to speak that word of forgiveness publicly in his service, where called pastors are to speak the word of Christ, to pronounce the words of holy absolution to the people of God so that they may know for certain that they have God's forgiveness in Christ's death and resurrection. He also authorizes pastors to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and to distribute the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins for the sake of God's people that they may know that they have God's forgiveness. These eternal gifts of God have their authority and their origin with Jesus. Jesus is the one who has earned forgiveness for you by his death and resurrection. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus so that he might authorize others, his ambassadors, his representatives, his priesthood of all believers to speak his forgiveness to those who are broken, condemned, and damned under the law. So that those who are crushed and broken and damned under the law can ultimately be forgiven, healed, and restored by the death and resurrection of Jesus. For the desire of the Lord is not the death of anyone. He wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You can find and follow Zion Lutheran Church Plumas on Facebook under Zion Lutheran or on our open Facebook page called Zion's Sermons. Please like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.